Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business, and she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love and will help you to up your writing game. Pico's School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted, and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters. More in-depth courses will be added in 2020. Make sure you don't miss a thing. Picoshouse.com slash newsletters. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2 are only 99 cents for a limited time. The gods are rightfully imprisoned, and Cess intends to keep them that way. But her terrorist father has other plans. Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her but some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little, books one and two, only 99 cents for a limited time. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today. Visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Joseph Cannon on the show with me today. He has a phenomenal new book. It's called The Accomplice, uh, one of the best books I've read this year. Um, excited to have you on the show today. Joseph, welcome. Well, pleased to be with you. Uh, Joseph, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, with me, it, it's a difficult question because I spent most of my working life in publishing on the other side of the desk. Um, I suppose that meant that I, I mean, certainly I was a great reader as a child and I always respected people who wrote. Um, I didn't fantasize about being a writer and found myself um, working in editing and publishing books rather than actually writing them. But midway through, I mean, I was 50 years old when I first started writing. So I guess I'm a poster boy for midlife career change. (laughs) I love that. It happened because I was in the Southwest on vacation with my wife um, hiking. And we were in Santa Fe 
And it was very near Los Alamos. It's about 40 miles from where the Manhattan Project had been conceived. And I'd always been interested in things World War II. And I said, let's go see it. And while we were there, I was so struck by the fact that it was this all-American town of the 50s, because most of it was built then, but that in fact, historically, it had once been the most secret place on Earth. And I thought, what was it like to actually come here? It's, you know, you fall off the planet. You don't go home for Thanksgiving. There aren't any breaks. You stay there and people communicate through a post office box. You know, it technically, the city did not exist. And it was at that moment that I had one of those light bulbs over the head where I thought, how interesting, what would have happened had there been a crime? How would they go about solving that? If a place does not really exist, you couldn't call police out there because it was meant to be a secret um, installation. And I was still the publisher and I thought, you know, that's not a bad premise for a book and who's looking for an idea? Who can I give it to? But in fact, nobody was really looking and I think people should have their own ideas. And I had become really fascinated by it. Um, it was also, this was the summer of 95, so it was the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima. And there was a lot of stuff in the press about the Manhattan Project, and a lot of it I thought was skewed, it, It's because by this time I knew a little bit more than when I had first gone there. And it seemed to me that we were carrying 50 years of our own nuclear baggage and writing all of these op-ed pieces that were appearing everywhere because it was all about the victimization and present, but fair enough, and presenting the Manhattan Project scientists themselves as kind of Dr. Strangelubs who had gone to a desert outpost to plot the end of the world. And I thought the truth is so much more interesting and nuanced and, and ironic because this was, you know, statistics can sometimes tell you a lot. The average age of the scientist on the project was 27. Oppenheimer himself was just turning 40. This was, they were kids. And this was the Silicon Valley of the 40s. And I thought, what if it had been you? What if somebody had come to you, you're at Caltech, maybe your eyes aren't great, so you're not drafted. And they said, we'd like you to come and work for the government. It's secret, it's open-ended, you will never, you, we don't know when it will finish, but you'll be working with the top people in your field. You may win a Nobel Prize, you're gonna cross some frontier of science and you're gonna win the war for us. I would have said yes. And I would have been one of those people that now were being written up as, um, essentially moral villains. And I thought this seems to me a really intriguing idea and background for a book. What happens when good people for supposedly the right reasons do things that create these appalling legacies and consequences, things that were not necessarily intended, but which we now have to live with forever. That seemed to me a good idea for a book. And this is a very long-winded answer, I'm afraid, to your question. But no, it's uh, perfect. I then wrote it. And I did it in secret because I didn't know if I could write. I thought, what could be more embarrassing than a publisher who can't write? And people would never stop teasing you about it if it didn't work out. But as it happened, it was a very lucky kind of Cinderella story. It did work out. Um, the book worked and it was um, a success. And it enabled me to cross over the desk and write permanently full time, something I did not know that I wanted to do. But once I started doing it, I loved it. And I realized that Maybe this is where it was all heading. So sh long answer short to your question, <laughs> it took me 50 years to start writing, but I suppose I'd always wanted to. I, I love that answer. I absolutely love that answer. Um, you said that you had been uh, kind of a, a World War II buff um, through the years, and which led you to uh, you know that, that initial visit that, that cranked up your, your publishing career, your, your writing career for yourself. Um, when it when you started working on the book and, you know, getting into the, the real details and getting into, um, you know, what really made that place tick and the people that were there, um, how did you go about the, uh, the process of researching uh, to really get down to what the truth of the place was? Well, one of the, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that there, there are some veterans from the project that still survived. But I find that it's not really useful to talk to people. First of all, the authority they bring to this means that you're going to believe their version. But it's not necessarily the true one. I think we all just see the world from our own vantage point. So I didn't interview people. Um, I just read everything I could 
find, of which, of course, there's a great deal. There's long literature on the Manhattan Project. And I was particularly intrigued with Oppenheimer. I mean, he's just one of the great characters, I think, of the 20th century. And I felt awkward about this because I have very mixed feelings about using real people in books. I think somehow it becomes exploitative. And the last thing I wanted was that uh, with somebody like Oppenheimer. On the other hand, it seemed to me that somebody had to authorize this investigation that was going to be the story of the book. And to pretend that it would be somebody other than Oppenheimer was like saying Roosevelt wasn't president. I mean, everyone knows he was running it, so you had to do it. So I thought, all right, let's do this. Let's just do as little damage as we can. We'll have the scene where he authorizes the investigation and we'll get in and out as quickly as possible and not try to mess up. And it was one of those writing cliches. I, you know, from the minute that I walked, I as the writer or the character walks into his office, he took over the book. And I realized that he incorporated everything that was really thematically interesting to me about this. Um, people who are creating something that's, you know, this isn't a bigger bow and arrow. This is, this is a weapon beyond, this is a weapon that actually has the promise of self annihilation. That's a true game changer. I think the world pivots from the first time that bomb has exploded in Alamogordo. We are in a different world and we're in the world that we, I, grew up in. Um, I was born in 46, so I'm truly a product of the atomic age. And that mushroom, we grew up under that mushroom cloud and it's still there. It's just that people don't um, somehow have the notion that it's all gone away. It hasn't gone away. When, as a kid, uh, I was born in, in 71, so my parents were, were your generation, and we inherited that, uh, that legacy and that mushroom crowd, cloud, uh, that we didn't grow up under the mushroom cloud like you did, but we grew up under the threat of another one with the Cold War. And, uh, so yeah, th these things are extremely complicated. Um, and, you know, what, what's really strange, uh, about, the Manhattan Project and that time and the technology that came out of that is there, there have been, uh, there has been some good that came out of that. We, there, there are some technological advances that have come about, um, that, that came out of that, yet we still have this complicated history as well. And in, in your new book, The Accomplice, um, it, it seems like the moral quandary, uh, is, is much more black and white than it might have been, uh, in your first book, but, but then, you know, as you do, uh, as we start peeling back these characters and the situations, things get very gray uh, in a lot of areas. Is is that something that you relish as a writer, um, taking the uh, the absolutes away, so that we're left to wrestle with what humanity means in the midst of these complicated people and situations? Yes, um, in a word, I think that. Um it's at the basis of all fiction that has any serious um, seriousness in the background. It's, you know, the great questions are, how do we live? And how do we live? How should we live? And often I think that we, you know, I once used a movie metaphor to describe the, the impact of World War II and the atomic age, the Cold War, etc., on our lives. And I said, the war began with the black and white clarity of Casablanca, where you know exactly where you stand, you know who's standing up to sing the Marseillaise, and it's a very romantic, clear-cut notion about the world. But the war ends with the third man, where everything is morally muddled and murky, gray, and I think that's the world that we inherited. It's certainly the one that I've chosen to write about. I think it's the interesting way to look at it. There was a question in one of the books that a character asked, when he says, what do you do when there's no right thing to do? Just the less bad thing or the it will cause the less harm. I think we're confronted by situations like that all the time. And, you know, how we resolve them is really the test of our character. And, and isn't fiction writing really an exploration of character? To me, that's fundamentally all that it's about. All the rest, I think, is dressing. Uh, by my count, uh, The Accomplice is your ninth novel. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, it looks to me as if uh, all of your stories have taken place in this era, and most of them deal with uh, this political and uh, geopolitical and personal fallout 
of of this time and this great upheaval that our um that our society uh went through and then the the world we inherited on the other side of that um you said that you were a, a big you know um student and and buff of this uh, of this time period uh, right now in publishing is is a, a fantastic time for historical fiction especially uh, around this era, there's a lot of interest uh, around this era, and we've had a great number of authors over the last couple of years, especially that are writing lots of stories around World War II and uh, around the time after that. Um, it, it seems like the publishing world has has finally caught up to you and and what you were interested in, uh, which I love. Um, why do you think that uh, there's such an interest in this time uh, right now? Is it because a lot of the players um, the, the real world players uh, during this time are, uh, are, are leaving us and we're, uh, you know, at, uh, at risk of losing these stories, uh, from these real people. Is that why, uh, we're so interested in these right now? I think that may be part of it, but I think that the larger reason, um, I would say is it, it is still the pivotal event, uh, of our times by our, I mean, several generations, you yeah. know, World War II was the worst thing that ever happened in terms of loss of life. And uh, so it's an inherently dramatic things that happened during that period. And in the immediate aftermath, decisions are being made by perfectly ordinary people like you and me that are going to have ramifications for 50 and 60 years to come. So it's, I think, a real hinge time and consequently one that any writer is drawn to because practically anything people do takes on an importance whether they realize it or not. But it's also, uh, aside from it being dramatic, I, th I think that to write about the past is we do it because we can finally see things clearly. If you want to use a different kind of metaphor, if you were in the middle of a battle, in a sense, you have absolutely no idea what's going on except how you're shooting and who's shooting at you and everything is chaos and people are whirling around and who knows. But once you can look at it from the distance of several years, once you can figure out exactly how things have been played out, you get that you, you can see things more clearly. And I think there's a great drive on the part of fiction writers to want to look at the past because we finally have enough information to try and put it with all of its nuances into a real perspective, something that is almost impossible about contemporary life. Contemporary life is just happening all around us and it's chaotic. And we don't quite know what's going to be enduringly important from it. You know, revisit this year, 25 years from now, and I wonder what they'll think we were thinking. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's scary to think. Um, well, it's a little depressing in that. It, it, it is. It is. Um, a number of your novels have dealt with uh, espionage and this idea of the players behind the scenes and things that are going on. Um, you, you mentioned when uh researching Los Alamos um that you know there's there's a you know a narrative that was uh, uh being put forth during uh the time of the Manhattan project and there's now this sort of narrative that we've inherited you know 50s or well more than that now um years later uh and the the truth seems to to change the more perspective we get and a, a lot of times the the reality is somewhere in between those things where we maybe we're we're not as great as we thought we were or we're also not as evil as as it may seem that we were at the time that you know motivations are strange things especially seen through the lens of of, of time and space um when when you're looking into these past uh events and and episodes uh, how do you weigh out uh to try to get to what the truth is uh you know the the narratives of then and now, and just because our 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 attitudes have changed now, does that mean that that things were really as bad as they were? How, how do you start sorting that out to to get to the truth of it? It's well, you put your finger on an, an interesting aspect of this. I mean, it is far and away the most difficult aspect of writing, let's say, in period rather than in history. Um, to me, it just seems like the recent past. But anyway, it's period writing is to really get inside the head of what, what people were thinking at the time and um, how it seemed to them. 
how it seems to us is entirely different. And I think that one of the flaws possibly of a lot of historical writing is that we're really talking about ourselves today. We just want to use the past as an example right. to, prove, you know, to prove whatever we're trying to prove about 19, uh, 2019. But to really understand what was in people's heads, um, I find that there are all kinds of uh, research tools. I mean, it's not just looking at documents and archives. That's a kind of limited thing. But you read everything, and particularly you read accounts that were written at the time. I mean, any journalist who's kept a diary, anybody who's been writing letters during that period, often what's fascinating is what they don't say, things that are just, uh, that we would pick up and notice instantly. Uh, say, an attitude about women, for instance. Um, which in 2019 would be some kind of glaring symbol coming off the page, just passes by. It's people are not thinking about that. They're thinking about something else. So what you want to do is try and recreate that without, in, a, in essence, approving it. I mean, you're not, I don't think we write about the past to say it was better, it was worse, it was this, it was that. I think it, this is the place where the story took place. And you want to keep it as true as possible to how the characters would have felt. But we're nevertheless looking at it from our eyes, from the eyes of 2019. And all of the repercussions and aftermath that we bring to it. It's a tricky proposition. I, I don't claim that anybody does it per, um, perfectly. Um, you just try to do it the best way you can. My books originally started, there was... Manhattan Project, and then there were several that were in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And with this current one, um, the last book was called Defectors, and it was set in 61 in Moscow. It was about the spies who had defected to the Soviet Union and what kind of lives they found there. And while I was researching it, I wanted to know what, were, what was on people's conversation during that period in 61. What would they be talking about? And one of the things that people were talking about was the capture of Adolf Eichmann and the trial and the man in the glass box. And I had lived through this as a teenager, but I wasn't paying the sort of attention that a serious person would pay to it. And I became absolutely fascinated by it. I thought this was another one of these truly pivotal moments. This started, in a sense, the international conversation about the Holocaust. Up until then, so many people were in denial or in forgetting and then let's move on. You know, the word Holocaust itself was, didn't really come into general usage until about 1954. That's, you know, almost 10 years after the war. That's a long time. And, but in 61, but all of a sudden Eichmann happens and the generation of forgetting is encountering the generation of conscience. What do we do about this? This is appalling. We need to talk about this. We need to talk about what happened. And so many of the perpetrators are still at large. They have been hidden. They, people have been aiding and abetting their, their hiding. They're getting away with it. They're not being put on trial. And I thought, oh, what also what must have been happening was that people who thought they were safe, people who were in Latin America leading new lives, all of a sudden realize that if they can snatch Eichmann off the street corner in Buenos Aires, they can snatch me, they can find me. And this would cause a real sea change in the way that um, war criminals were experiencing their exile or their new lives. That interested me. This business about time, by the way, I think I should tell you, now that we're up to 1962, my wife thinks that if I just keep going, eventually I will write a contemporary novel which <laughs> she would like to see. But I... So I think, you know, one thing sort of leads to the next. We'll see where we go. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, the the book, the the accomplice, the new book, um, we're 17 years after uh, after the war. Um, and, you know, Berlin and, and, and Germany is changing. Uh, we we now see the the rise of the Cold War. And, you know, the book kind of opens in a way that uh, that a lot of. Uh, post World War II spy thrillers might open, and you know we think that the story is going to be one thing, and this is kind of well worn um, territory. If we're talking about um, you know a the, the Cold War with the Soviets, and then we take a a dramatic left turn, and uh, like you described, the the exile of these former Nazis in South America, um, 
really fascinating to me. And, and I know there's been some talk over the last few years where this is becoming uh, – we're becoming more and more aware of, of what actually happened with these people. Um, wh- what has brought about this um, – uh, all, all of the information that we're getting um, about what really happened to those uh, Third Reich members uh, in South America. And and was that kind of overlooked for a while? Why, why is this just now becoming um, kind of top of our consciousness? There was practically no information coming out un- until the capture of Eichmann. I mean, until this opened up that whole can of worms. It had always been rumored that uh, high place. Nazi war criminals had escaped to South America and they were hiding. And, you know, even as I was reading about the Eichmann and the aftermath, I thought, what had been my impression about this? And I didn't really have a fixed idea of what their lives could have been like. I thought, what, they were hiding in some jungle hut in Paraguay or something? Instead of they're actually hiding in plain sight by going to an office under another name. Um, I... To me, this is the great backstory of the book. I mean, the front story is the search for one of these criminals and what happens and what are the moral prices that our investigator, that our hunter is going to have to pay to achieve this if you really want to capture this guy. And you do want to capture this guy. I didn't want any ambiguity about this man's guilt. He is a monster and had worked with Mengele on these ghastly experiments in Auschwitz that are now well known because luckily some people had survived and we have testimony to that effect. And they kept their own records. You know, all of these insane measurements that he was taking of twins, he was fascinated by twins, were being sent to an institute in Berlin so that their archival material about what they were doing at Auschwitz, it didn't occur to them at this point that this would come back to haunt them. They thought they were involved in some scientific experiment. I mean, essentially, uh, Mengele, who is the one I think we have most information about, would often be on the selection line deciding which of the um, prisoners who had just been come in on the train, which were healthy enough to work, um, who was so unhealthy that they would go directly to the chamber, gas chambers, etc. A horrible kind of thumbs-up, thumbs-down selection. But when you, know, you, you would think this would be portrayed as a real sadist walking up and down, maybe even with a whip in his hand, and making life and death decisions of a really appalling nature. But in fact, all of the descriptions about him from people who had been there say he was sort of indifferent. He was blithe. It was just something that he was doing as part of the job. And his notion all along was these people are here to die. And since they're going to die anyway, why shouldn't we get some scientific benefit and use them instead of rabbits or white mice or whoever else we would like to experiment on? That people can think in those terms that he could have so dehumanized these other people is still appalling. I mean, after how many decades? How how do we deal with this? Anyway, I I wanted someone who was clearly guilty. But how do you go about finding such a person? And what are you going to have to do to get him? And are you really willing to pay some of the moral gray area price tags or prices that have been put on the actual capture of this man? That's the front story. But the back story to me is the one we've just been talking about that really interested me is how did they live in Latin America? Where did they live? Was he in a... In a in an apartment, um, in some house in suburban Buenos Aires? Did they work? Did their families know? Did their neighbors know who they were? Um, You know, it's interesting. Adolf Eichmann, for instance, did change his name, but he didn't have his children change their name so that they were the Eichmann boys. And there must have been this sense of security that was strong enough that they would make these decisions. Mengele had changed his name initially um, during the 40s, because in the late 40s, these people really were being rounded up in Europe and brought to trial. But that eventually ended. And I think there was just a sense of exhaustion and moral exhaustion with all of these trials. And the Cold War had kicked in with real fury at this point, And all energy and attention was de- devoted to that. It was about how are we dealing with Russia? And uh, certainly this was the case in Germany, which was 
visibly split all the time. So I thought, well, okay, um, one of the reasons they were there for all of these years without anybody catching them is that nobody was looking very hard. It was easy for them to get away with it. Um, Mengele changed his name, but then when it became useful to have his real name, he started using it. Um, he had to do it for some court documents to buy into a pharmaceutical company that he was a partner with in Argent partner in, in Argentina. It also was the quality of their lives differentiated was differentiated by uh, who they had been in Germany and what kind of money and connections they had. Mengele, for instance, came from a well-off family. They were industrialists. They made farm equipment. Ironically enough, um, after the war, they had a secondary boom in their factory because they manufactured the wheelbarrows that were being used to take away all the debris from the bombed-out cities. But that was Mengele. He had access to money. Eichmann didn't, and consequently uh, ran in a totally different social circle. They did meet. Um, there were at least two recorded meetings between the two of them. But they had nothing to say to each other because they were not particularly um, certainly close, and they weren't really of the same social class, so they lived differently. Anyway, how people lived there and how they got away with it is really what got me into writing this book. And I thought, well, what was that life like? And how did they get there? You know, even in the chaos of post-World War II Europe, you couldn't just hop on a plane and fly to Rio or fly to Buenos Aires. There were, you know, these are countries where, that have entry requirements the same way that America would. So how was this all facilitated? And the unholy surprise to me was that I had always assumed that Odessa, even if it was an unofficial kind of network of people helping was really a German enterprise that they were helping each other get out. But it was quite the opposite. It was really the Argentines who were actively recruiting them and wanted to give safe harbor to a lot of these Nazis. And we're talking a lot of people. This isn't just five or 10. It's hundreds, even thousands, possibly, of Germans who were allowed into the country. Some, ostensibly because they were going to be consultants to the military or they could provide some kind of useful aid to what was essentially a dicta you know, dictatorship in Argentina who had been sympathetic to Hitler. But all roads beyond them led to the Vatican and led to the church. And this great um, saving of Nazi war criminals and getting them to Latin America truly could not have happened without the help of the church. What? What? Uh, I, I, Why I, I'm, would, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm speechless when we start. Yeah, I know. It's an interesting thing. Well, first of all, one, Bishop Hudal, who was the uh, most famous of the people who had helped, um, was Austrian born and was very sympathetic to the Germans. So there was that. Um, I won't even get into the, the notion of anti Semitism because presumably he was as well. But essentially, this, is, this goes back to that earlier part of the conversation where I say the difficult thing is getting into people's heads at the time. How do people think then? And what people were thinking about then, if you were Bishop Hudal or someone like him, is that the final conflict had come and the final fatal conflict had not been World War II. It was going to be the fight against the godless communists who were always perceived as the greatest enemy of the church. I mean, this was the real fight to the death. So anyone who had been experienced in fighting the Russians and fighting the communists was someone to be um, treasured, valued. Um, there was the notion that there would be another war, and there would be another war very soon, and all of the allies would need the resources of Catholic Argentina, which had been neutral during the war, but now would, was willing to fight this great fight because it was also partly a Christian crusade against communists. You know, odd as this now sounds, and sometimes even beyond crank, you know, this is beyond a cranky room. This is nutty. Right. Um, or a, certainly appears to be, but in fact, it was a deeply held conviction. People were sure that uh, now that Hitler was gone, the Allies would turn on the Russians, and the church had to help. It's, it's, so, it, it's so crazy. You know, a, a little bit of perspective uh, through history uh, is 
is eye opening to say the least. Um, it, you know, one of the uh, the best uh, the best kinds of villains are the ones who believe they are the heroes of their own stories, and and you've done such a great job with the the villains in this book. Um, and who, you know, if if they didn't believe they were the heroes of their story, at least they um, believed that they were doing something uh, noble, you know, as as scientists, or uh, you know, at least not causing the world as they saw it any harm. Um, but then, you know, the other side of that is your protagonist um, also need to uh, be nuanced. Uh, we can't just have a protagonist who comes in and who is. Uh, absolutely morally superior, doing everything for the right reason, and you know ends up victorious because of their purity of heart and and nobility. Um, and you you bring us a couple of characters um, who who really um, set the stage for what is to come in the book. And the, those characters, Max Weil, and then his uh, his nephew Aaron Wiley. Um, tell us a little bit about those characters, where they came from. And what you chose to put them through in the book? Well, Max Weil is um, one of the great original Nazi hunters. There were a few that um, came out of the war and started compiling documents instantly because they were helping um, the Americans put on these trials. It was mostly an American affair. The, the Brits didn't have a lot of money in 1945 and were perhaps a little more worldly wise and cynical about this, thinking, you know, what, what's the point of these trials? But the Americans wanted them. And there were a number, not just Nuremberg, there were a whole series of them. And people who were employed in compiling the dossiers and getting documentation and to make a legal case against some of these people were really invaluable. And Max would be one of these. He then made it his life's crusade. His whole family had been wiped out at Auschwitz. And this was you know, uh, uh, not just simply vengeance. I think in his mind, it's how do we, how do you render justice to a crime that immense? How do you do that? And he wanted to be part of that. In the same way that um, Wiesenthal, who would be a famous real life figure, had been compiling dossiers all these years. So that that was Max. And Max is now at the end of his life. He can't, um, he's got serious heart issues. He's not really going to be able to continue doing this. And he wants his nephew to carry on for him. And the nephew had grown up in America because they got out early during the Nazi regime. He has his own agenda. He doesn't particularly want to do this, but he is drawn into it. He's drawn out of obligation to Max and finally and ultimately out of some obligation to the kind of justice that Max was after, that it was a justifiable kind of hunt on his part. What he discovers, however, is that nothing is quite so easy and clean cut, and you're going to have to make some uh, shortcuts, some moral sacrifices. But how far do you go? Where do you draw the line? I mean, are you going to betray someone that you have fallen in love with, that you're having an affair with? Are you going to use people that way? Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's a spoiler about the book to say that one of the ways he tracks down this criminal is to befriend the criminal's daughter who may or may not know what the crim where the criminal is. And in the, process, in the process of doing this, he creates for himself an immense personal complication. Is it really worth betraying her to go after this guy? Where, where do you draw the line of your own personal morality? I love it. The, the book, The Accomplice, uh, is available everywhere now in hardcover, audiobook, and Kindle. Um, Joseph, you, you mentioned that you were, uh, creeping toward modernity, uh, in your storylines. <laughs> um, what, uh, you know, this book is out now, which means you probably finished it a, a year ago. Um, what are you working on now? Well, I think we're going to go back to Berlin. Berlin is uh, the place that I, I keep returning to because the stories are endless and it just, there are certain places that speak to you, and um, places in, as in general is a very important component in all of the books. Sometimes the book begins that way. Uh, I wrote a book called Istanbul Passage because I had gone to Istanbul as a tourist, and I just fell in love with it, and I wanted to know more about it. And what I discovered is that all the guidebooks end with Atatürk, 
and they don't talk about the war and things that interested me. And I thought, well, what happened here? And it turns out that it was a great listening post for spies because it was right on the border of this conflagration that was going on. And this, you know, if you went to the hotel at night and to the cafe, you were essentially at Rick's Cafe. This was the real Casablanca. Every other table, someone was a spy. If you write the sort of things that I write, this was catnip. So I thought, well, you know, I have to do it. But there are places that speak to you that uh, you just you can't get them out of your system. And for me, that place, I guess, is Berlin. I've now written two novels that were set there. The Good German is in the immediate aftermath. of It's Berlin in 45. Um, and leaving Berlin is we move up to the airlift. We're at 48. And now what I'm working on is Berlin in the 60s with the wall. Um, so we're still creeping up in time. This, this last book was 1962. I think we're going to go to 64 or 63. It's slow, but let's assume I have that much time, and then we'll finally get to the contemporary. I love it. I love it. Um, Joseph, as someone who began his writing career at age 50, I believe you said, um, do you have any advice for someone who may feel like they've waited too long, uh, that, that this is maybe a young man's game? Um, would you have any advice for, for someone who thinks um, that, that they have a story in them but is maybe afraid to try? You know, my experience is that people don't need that encouragement. There, are, there seem to be a million people working on their own stories. There are just a lot of people. I don't mean to be, you know, less than sympathetic. Sure. I mean, certainly the advice would be, oh, don't be silly. You know, if you've got a story to tell, tell it. Now, is the publishing industry, I mean, is that a young man's game? Certainly it favors the young because you're going to have a longer run. Um, but that has nothing to do with writing itself. You know, if all you ever write is one good book, you've written one good book, so do it. I think where I always uh, fall apart from or fall on the other side of, of people doing this late in life is that I think for so many people, what they really want to write are memoirs. And they really, you know, my advice whenever I talk to people who are in a writing class is write something that isn't about you, because everything you write is about you. Every word you select, every sensory impression is something that you've experienced, and you are throughout this book. But you already know you, or at least as much as you're going to. What's really important is who are these other people? I mean, isn't this the ultimate mystery? How do, how do you know someone else? And this goes beyond the question of just trusting. I mean, I think in espionage, it's at the heart of the great character revelation because, you, you know, these are people who are 24-7 pretending to be someone else. That's not the case with most of us. But are we really knowable to each other? And isn't this really the great mystery? Isn't this what we're trying to unlock? So I think my only advice would be, Write, and write if you feel you must. I mean, why not? What's What are you going to lose? But write about some other people, too. Don't just assume that this is going to be, I have a story to tell. Why don't you become interested in somebody else? I think that's uh, fantastic advice. Uh, very well put. Uh, the book, The Accomplice, is out everywhere now. Um, Joseph, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes. Um, if people are just discovering you, and want to dig into your amazing back catalog and all of the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Oh, sure. I mean, well, there's a website, um, josephcannon.com. Um, all of the books are available. So they, Amazon, like, you know, would have listings for, or BNN would have for all of them. So you can, you can see the full panoply of books. We'll, uh, we'll link them all up in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. It was a great conversation. Thank you.